هو الذي We begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help, and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that indeed Allah alone is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. Before we actually answer the question of today's lecture, is there a God? It's the question, is there a God? It might be useful to explore the meaning of some words. So the first thing that we would like to ask is, what is a God? Actually, I'd like to ask you that question. What is a God? I, I'm not asking you, what is the God? I'm asking, what is a God? What makes something a God? So there you go, it's a question. The question needs an answer. You can sit here all night. So you can try and answer my question. What is, if you don't answer me, I'll just pick on people and say, you give me something. So either you can volunteer, right? And you can put your hand up and give me, yeah, go on sister, yes. Someone who's created the universe. Okay, I specifically said, although Jazakallah khair for that, and very courageous for, you know, being the first person, but I did specifically say, I didn't want to know what is the God. Yeah, didn't I say that? I want to know what is a God. So, for example, um, did, um, did Ganesh create the universe? Did, do Hindus believe that Ganesh created the universe? Huh? No? No, I mean, they, he didn't. They don't, right? Or, you know, Aphrodite, yeah, the goddess of love. Do they believe that she created the universe? No. Okay, but she's still a goddess, and he, Krishna, or whoever, or Ganesh, is still a god. So, I'm not asking for a definition of the creator. I'm asking, what is a god, not the god? Yes, sister. Okay, something that you worship, or something that is worshipped. Okay, that's a good start. That's a very good start. Still not enough, though. We want something else. What we want to know, okay, is why do people worship things then? It's very important. Why do people worship things? Why do they worship these gods? Come on, everyone. Good. First brother. Amazing. Yeah, go on. Okay. So they believe in a higher being than themselves. Right? Some people may imagine that David Beckham is a higher being than themselves. Actually, some people might worship David Beckham. But certainly, they might believe he's superior in some things. But it's still, okay, so, okay, all you've made now is you, we've gone back a bit and we've answered, or we've gone back to uh, what is a God. It's something that people believe is a higher being. But we've moved on a bit because the sister, alhamdulillah, mashallah, she said something which quite rightly, it's something that people worship. So now we want to explore why do people worship things? What's worship all about? What does it involve, worship? Because the people think Lord can uh, do anything and they give us everything. Good. That's very good. Okay, excellent. 
people worship these gods because they think that those gods can give them something. They think that by worshipping these things, they can get something from those gods. So they imagine that by worshipping this thing, or they believe that this god can give them what they want and what they need. So, a god, a god is something that people believe can give them what they want and what they need. That's what a god is. Right? Okay? Now, often in religions, people have different gods for different things. All right? So in some religions, you will find that they have a particular god that if you, you know, if you're fighting a war and you want to win, then you worship the god of war. Right? Like Mars, for example, originally was a god of war. Right? Mars is one of the gods of war of the ancient Greeks. Okay? And uh, any, by the way, could everyone please turn their mobile phones off or put them on silent? The brother forgot to mention that. Yeah. Um, or, for example, if you want the rain to fall, they worship the rain god. If they, you know, want to, someone to love them, they might worship the, the god or goddess of love, right? So, people often in some religions, they have different gods for different things. They worship this god. And they think that by worshipping it, they're going to get what they want and get what they need. I used to be a Roman Catholic. In the, in, in the Roman Catholic faith, they had different saints for different things. The patron saint of travel. The patron saint of art. If you lost something, they used to tell us, if you've lost something, pray to Saint Anthony and he'll help you find it. He was the saint of lost things. Okay, so it's the same really. There's no difference from praying to saints or praying to, because at the end of the day when they pray, whatever you pray to, whatever you worship, you think that that thing by worshipping and praying and sacrificing and serving that God, that's how you will get what you want and what you need. And usually there is a set of rituals, a set of functions. It may be prayer, it may be sacrifice, it may be giving offerings, you know, and these things can reach extremes, including, for example, human sacrifice. In some religions, you know, humans were sacrificed to these gods. Like the Aztecs, for example, they used to practice human sacrifice. So, this is the religion. This is the religion, the worship of these gods is the ritualized behavior. The things that people do in order to get what they want from those gods. Yeah? Okay? So this is, these are the gods, and this is the religion. This is the worship of those gods. Right? Okay. So this is what a god is. A god is what people believe is going to give them what they want and what they need. And so people worship those gods, and they pray to them, sacrifice to them, and so on and so forth. So if we think, now let's go back and answer our question. Is there a god? Right. Well, no one could deny that there's not only a god. There are actually probably countless millions of gods. Because whatever people put their faith in and their hope in and their trust in, whatever people believe is going to give them what they want and what they need, that's their God. So everybody has a God of some degree or another because everybody puts their faith. And these gods are not always idols. They're not always saints. They're not always you know, people or things, often these gods can also be ideas. They can be concepts. Because people put their faith and trust in many different things. Not only idols and saints and prophets and so on and so forth. No, they also put their faith and trust in ideologies, communism. You know, science. Right? So these also can be gods. Let me give you an example. You see, I myself, I myself, as you've heard, I was brought up in, you know, although you might not know that now, but if you met me 20 years ago, you'd have no doubt from what sort of background I came from. So as the brother mentioned in the introduction, I was sent to a Roman Catholic monastic boarding school, a place called Ampleforth College. 
Ampleforth College is like the Catholic version of Eton. It is the top Roman Catholic boarding school. My mother had actually, you know, written me down to go there even before I was born. You know, so she had no doubt about where I was going to go, Ampleforth College. Okay, and it was a monastic boarding school, so it was run by monks. Now, um, my mother, my parents, um, my dad, to tell you the truth, my, my dad's pretty chilled out, but I mean, you know, my dad, his family have for generations been uh, in the colonial service. So my dad himself was a colonial administrator in Tanzania, which is where I was born. Um, my grandfather was a high court judge in Bombay. Um, and that's as far back as I know, but uh, so we, you know, my, my dad's family have been in the colonial service. And my mum actually is Polish, but she was brought up in Kenya. And uh, she's more English than English people. And she's very, very, uh, you know, concerned with the etiquettes and the manners of being very correct. And so I was brought up very strictly, not just as a Catholic, but, you know, my mum was not very strict about her Catholicism. I suppose she expected that I would get that from the school. But she was very strict about our manners, how we should behave, that we should use the right words. Okay, my dad taught me the etiquettes of how to dress, for example. Very specific rules about dress. And, you know, I, I can look at someone straight away until today, and I could know how well brought up that person is or badly brought up they are by looking at the way they're dressed, by looking at the type of shoes that they wear. You know, for example, my dad would teach me, you never wear brown shoes with black. Oh, dear. <laughs> you never wear brown shoes. With, you don't. You know, it's just, he said, Ant, you just don't do that. It's, it's just not done. You know, how do you, what's the correct way to wear your tie? What was the correct way to put your handkerchief in your pocket? You never fold your handkerchief in the pocket. Never. That's, that, you know, that was, uh, you, well, they say, they used to say it's non-you. It's just, meaning it is not a, uh, the right way to do things. It's, these are the type of details. And as for eating, you know, the dinner was a, you know, sort of major ritual. And even down to how do you eat your bread roll? Even to how you eat your bread roll. You know, everything had to be correct. You had to take a bit of butter from the butter dish with the knife that was the butter dish knife and then put it on your side plate and then return that knife to the butter dish and then take your own personal butter knife which is, you know that's because it's the small one, right? And then you break your bread roll, not in the air, but on the plate. And you take a piece and butter that piece of bread roll on the plate and then lift it to your mouth and eat it. Woe betide the one who gets a bit of butter, you know? <laughs> butter! <laughs> butter! You know, and, and so this, you know, the, and, and what is all of this about? It's because they believe that by following these rituals, and that's what it is, they're type of rituals. It's a type of, in fact, a type of religion. Because they believe that by following these rituals, you will be identified as being a member of the upper middle classes. And when people know that you're a member of the upper middle classes, doors open for you that would never open otherwise. In other words, they believe that this is the way and this is the thing that will get you what you want and what you need. So therefore, it becomes a, a type of God. Right? Becomes a type of God. Because people put their faith in it and their trust in it and their hope in it. And they imagine that these are the things that will make them successful in life. And of course, like any God that people worship, if you ask Hindus or Buddhists or any people who worship idols, they will tell you stories about how they prayed to their God and this thing happened and how they offered things to that God and the God drank from the, you know, Ganesh drinking milk. Do you remember that when Ganesh all around the world started drinking milk? Yeah? 
all those miracles and you must have heard of the virgin mary crying and you know and and the crucified jesus dripping with blood you must have heard about all of these things right so all of these things you know they say these are the miracles and these show that our gods are real and it's the same it's the same with belonging to the upper middle class people say well our experience tells us that you know uh, and it's true in some cases it's true that you will get a job just by virtue of what school you went to there are certain newspapers in this country and this is very telling by the way if you think about the whole idea of so-called the free press and free speech that they talk about no the people who write for newspapers are a very carefully selected bunch of people by and large who belong to a particular elite who have most of them studied in a particular group of schools and who conform to a particular way of thinking about how the world should be so it's very important to understand this people have gods everybody has a god most people have many gods so the real question we need to be asking today is not is there a god but rather because the answer to that simply is there are millions of gods countless millions of gods but actually the real question is out of all the things that people worship and put their faith in and put their trust in are any of these things truly worthy of it in other words are they really capable of giving people what they want and what they need and so what i'm going to do today is i am going to use the quran to analyze all the different things that people worship now you may say okay could we have a cup of coffee now because it's going to be quite a long time to go through the millions and millions of i'm of course i'm not going to go through every individual god that people worship or have worshipped of course not but what we can do is we can divide these gods into broad categories we can categorize them and this is what the quran we can see the quran does the quran uses certain examples allah you god uses certain examples in the quran to identify certain types of religion certain types of worship certain types of gods and then the quran shows us why these things are not worthy of worship and what method does the quran use you know it's very beautiful the quran really appeals to something that all human beings have it now not every human being is a philosopher or has the capability of being a philosopher not every human being is a theologian and nor are they all capable of being a theologian not every human being is capable of becoming a mystic and an ascetic in order to become enlightened with spiritual truths because most human beings have to just get on with their life in order to survive buddhism for example if you look at the teachings of buddha and you look at the life of buddha buddha teaches that in order to achieve enlightenment you have to abandon the world and live in a monastery now if everybody abandoned the world and lived in a monastery the people even in the monastery would have no way to live so it's not a very inclusive type of religion although some buddhist countries have sort of worked out a rota that everyone spends a couple of years in, in the monastery you know like you have military service they have a couple of years in the monastery but uh, it's not really that's not what enlightenment really is supposed to be about however so what we find is that these are not really practical solutions if you want to appeal to someone how can we know the truth from the falsehood you can't expect everybody to be a philosopher a theologian a mystic or whatever so we find that the quran which is a book for everybody it's a book for the philosopher the theologian the mystic and the ordinary people 
because this is a book that we believe who, that is from the creator of ordinary people, which appeals to ordinary people. And so we're not really concerned whether these arguments impress the philosophers or the theologians or the mystics. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the Quran appeals to something that is common to humanity. And what is common to humanity? Actually, something we call common sense. Not logic, because logic is a systemized way of thinking. So we don't want to call it logic. We could call it reason. But even reason is not necessarily what we're talking about. What we are talking about is something even more fundamental, and that is common sense. And common sense is called common sense because it's common. Every single human being agrees about those things. There are certain, there are certain things that every human being agrees about. The only people who don't agree with it are people who are either insane, and that's why we call them insane, yeah, or perhaps philosophers. I'm not suggesting that philosophers are insane, or some, some people might, but you know, but they don't agree with these things because they're just, you know, contentious. They think it's their job to argue about everything. But otherwise, no, these are things that people all, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Isn't it a universal truth that every human being agrees about? That part of something is less than the whole. Yeah? A part of something is less than the whole of that thing. True? Isn't that a universal truth? So there's an example of a universal type of truth. Let me give you another example of a universal truth. You don't get something coming from nothing. True or not? Do you get something just spontaneously coming from nothing? Do we, have you ever, in the totality of human experience, heard of something spontaneously appearing out of nothing? No. That goes against common sense. I mean, okay, we've all seen a magician pull rabbits out of hats and stuff like that, but we know it's a trick. We know he's not really doing, we go, ooh, you know, because he's made us believe for a moment that he's done something impossible because our common sense and our common experience tells us that that's not possible. But we do know that you can't get something from nothing. We know it's a trick. Right? Okay. So we have these types of things, and we could list other ones. You could argue about something, but you know, uh, other ones that, that, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And so on and so forth. There are collective things that are, that are, that are, are common experiences of human beings. That wherever we are, as long as we call ourselves human, we experience these things and we can agree about these things. Yes? Now, I want to make an important point. This is very important. One of the things that human beings actually don't agree about a lot are things to do with ethics and morals. In fact, one of the things that is extraordinarily diverse amongst human beings are things to do with ethics and morality how we should behave, the things that we shouldn't and shouldn't do, the type of punishments that we should have. Okay? So for one society to say, oh, this society is backward and primitive, or this religion is wrong because it practices polygamy, whereas the right way to behave is monogamy, right? Actually, this is not a valid means through which and by which to judge anyone or anything. Because upon what basis is monogamy right and polygamy wrong? Having one wife only became the normal mode of behavior, to tell you the truth, in the northern hemisphere. And these were only based upon survival strategies in cold countries. It was just a lot easier to survive as human beings in cold countries with one wife and a few children. 
So the idea of just having a few kids and having one wife and a few kids was actually something that became established as part of the culture in this part of the world, mostly due to geography and climates, not to do with any moral superiority. And because it's more moral, it's just about that it was easier to survive like that. But due to the conditions in hot countries, okay, the survival strategies employed there were very, very different. So it is fallacious to say that we should make judgments about another culture or another religion based upon some aspects of their morality. And I'm, I'm not saying this absolutely because actually there are some things that are very common. Human beings universally almost always agree that it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to cheat, it's wrong to lie, so on and so forth. I mean, these things are pretty universally agreed upon. But, you know, apart from some basic moral structures, actually human beings have pretty diverse ideas about what should be the norms of a society. And I'm only saying that because you know what? What you will find is that most people who criticize Islam don't criticize Islam on the basis of the fundamentals of what our religion teaches. And the reason simply is, as I hope by the end of today I will show you, is that the fundamentals of what Islam teaches are so firmly rooted in reason and common sense that it is really virtually impossible to produce any type of effective argument against it. So therefore, the only manner or means in which they can try and make some capital out of criticizing Islam is about uh, some aspects of its morality. But uh, I, it's a false way to make a criticism because it's not really a valid means. It's not based upon universal principles. So let's go back. Let's use our common sense and let's look at some of the stories and the examples that the Quran uses and just let's see how very much based upon common sense these things are. So let's take the first category of people. The first category of people are those people who, and these are very few by the way, historically, even until today, the amount of people who actually say, I believe there is not a God that there is not a creator, that there is no being that has brought this universe into existence, that it's just a product of uh, random events or whatever. It's just time that destroys us. There were people in the time of the prophet who made claims like that. And there are people today who make claims like that. But historically, amongst humanity, they have been very, very few. And societies that have actually made such claims have either not existed at all or have lasted such a short time that they have evaporated in history. Like, for example, Soviet, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a self-declared atheist society. In other words, the belief system of the Soviet Union was that there is not a God. And this is what they attempted to force upon people, and you can see how long that society lasted. A mere, you know, what? You know, 80 years? Something like that? That's not very long in terms of human history, right? It's barely a bleep. So, similarly, you will find that all cultures... Even the most primitive cultures, so-called primitive cultures, have this concept of a transcendent being that has created the universe and has brought it into existence. The Ab Aborigines of Australia, the Zulus, you can go and look at g different cultures and you will find the idea of this created, this being that is different from the creation that is transcendent, this idea of this transcendent creator is universal in human culture. And the reason is, is because it is so fundamentally rooted in common sense. It's a common human experience. 
And so these things are not difficult to understand. The Qur'an, for example, poses a series of rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question is a question that is not supposed to have an answer. When someone asks a rhetorical question, they're not expecting you to answer it. In fact, the question in itself has an answer. For example, the Qur'an says, concerning or to those people who claim that there is not a God, that there is not a creator being who has brought this universe into existence, the Qur'an asks the rhetorical question, did it come from nothing, this universe? Did the universe come from nothing? That is a rhetorical question. Because it's obvious that you can't get something coming from nothing. As I've already stated, there is nothing in the totality of human experience that leads us to believe that you get something coming from nothing. Or that you get order spontaneously arising out of chaos. Rather, human experience tells us that where we see things working according to laws, according to patterns, according to systems, laws and patterns and systems have been imposed upon that thing. Right? That's why if you were walking in the desert in Saudi Arabia, right, and you found a mobile phone, what are the essential components of a mobile phone? The essential components of a mobile phone are plastic. Does anyone know what is the base material from which plastic is made? Sand. Huh? Sand. No, it's not sand. It's petroleum. petroleum. It's oil. However, there is something else that comes from sand, and that's the silicon chip. Silicon is, in fact... Sand. Silicon chip, its base material is sand. So two important things. A mobile phone is made out of sand and oil. But no one picks up a mobile phone in the desert and says, look, a product of billions of years of chance and coincidence. Yeah? The oil bubbled. Yeah? The wind blew. The sun shone. The lightning struck. The camel trod. Yeah? And after billions and billions of years of these things happening, by an amazing coincidence, this mobile phone formed itself, plant oil and sand. And I pressed it and, oh, hi, mum. <laughs> what a chance and coincidence. Let alone that these, all these mobile phones talk to each other and you can send a signal and you see how ridiculous it is. So common human experience tells us even something more simple, a piece of pottery, a piece of pottery, which is clay. When an archaeologist finds a little piece of pottery, he doesn't say, oh my gosh, chance and coincidence. He knows someone has made this. Someone has heated it. Someone has treated it. Someone has painted it. And in fact, this archaeologist could tell you so many things about that civilization from this one piece of pottery. He could theorize so many things. He could tell you about their state of knowledge, their technology, so many things you could understand from one piece of pottery. That is why the Qur'an keeps asking us, look at the alternation of the night and the day. Look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the winds, the ships in which you sail, the animals that you ride and that you eat. Look at yourselves. Travel through the earth. See how Allah brought about the creation. In all of these things are signs for those who are wise and for those who understand. They point us to one very, very obvious conclusion. That this incredibly organized, systemized universe and world in which we live, with so many intricately, coordinated mechanisms we find this symbiosis we find how one thing relies and depends upon another and we can think of so many examples we can think of so many examples you know I remember seeing until this day when I was a little kid David Attenborough going down a termite mound now termites are little creatures rather like ants and they build they build these incredible 
mounds of mud. So you can imagine in the equator, in Africa, extremely hot, and even in the nighttime, by the way, it gets really cold. Yet an amazing thing, these termites build at the base of this mound a series of rings out of mud. They build a series of rings. And also they have vents. And what this does is it keeps the heat, it keeps the temperature of this mound constant. It only fluctuates between a few degrees. And this is also includes the body heat of the termites. And they actually have a certain place in the termite mound where they grow a certain fungus which they live on. They farm a fungus. These are termites. Now these termites are not intelligent beings. They don't have brains. From where did they get this knowledge and this information? To build such a perfectly, <laughs> amazingly, intricately working mechanism. And they cooperate all together in order to do this. And we find these type of systems existing, even between anima and inanimate objects. We look at our Earth. Is it just coincidence that the Earth is at an optimal distance from the Sun? If we were in astronomical terms, and I'm not talking about three or four miles, okay? In astronomical terms, by the way, our, our galaxy is 100, the Milky Way, the galaxy in which we live, is 100,000 light years across. That means if you lived for 100,000 years and you traveled nonstop at the speed of light, that's how long it would take to cross our galaxy. And our galaxy is one of millions in the known universe, which is, I think, 10 billion light years across, right? So can you imagine the type of distances involved in the, in the universe, right? So therefore, understand that our Earth, when I say it's in an optimal, I'm not talking about a couple of miles. When something is within a couple of thousand or hundred thousand miles, in terms of the size of the universe, that's precise. Try and shrink that down in human terms. Imagine if you put that into terms, how precise. I don't think we could think of a mechanism in existence built by human beings that has the precision of the distance of the earth being from the sun. If we were much closer to the sun, then the, our planet would be too hot. If it was much further, it would be too cold. So in terms of the distance from the sun, the, si and the earth is at an optimal distance for life to exist. The size of the earth also is important. If the earth was much bigger, the gravitational forces would be too overwhelming. If it was much smaller, there would be not, not enough gravity. This is another point. How about the combination of gases on our planet? Not only oxygen, vital for the existence of life, but also carbon dioxide and nitrogen. It is this combination of gases. Pure oxygen is poisonous. If you breathe just pure oxygen for long enough, it will poison you. You need a balance of gases. We need carbon dioxide. Plants need carbon dioxide. Nitrogen is important for fertilizing the soil. Ozone, another gas. The ozone layer actually filters out the harmful rays of the sun's radiation. That's why they've been making a big fuss about the depletion of the ozone layer and the increase in skin cancer in Australia and other places where the ozone layers become depleted because the sun's rays are not being blocked anymore and they're starting to cause cancers. So does life exist without an ozone layer? It would not. It would be radiated out of existence. Look at these optimal conditions. The earth spins on its axis once every 24 hours. Imagine the earth was going really, 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 really slow. Right? Really slow. So the sun is shining on one part of the earth's surface for, say, 20 years. 
That's how slowly the Earth is spinning. What would happen? One part of the Earth's surface would be superheated. Another part of the Earth's surface would be supercooled. And I could go on and on. We could talk about water, how water has an incredible quality. If water did not have the quality that it did, life would not exist. So what we find is a super precise mechanism. I invite anyone to find me an example made by human beings of such a precise mechanism. You'll not find it. How could such, if we saw such a precise mechanism and we found one, we would automatically presume that some super intelligent person or group of people had managed to make this thing. It is therefore only common sense that when we look around us and we see these things, that we conclude there must be some intelligence, some power behind this. And this power must be very powerful, very wise, very intelligent. And it's also common sense to realize that this being cannot be like the creation. This being cannot be like the creation. Because if this being was like the creation, then that being would not be the creator. That being would just be another creation. And that would need another creator. And we only end up with the same dilemma. We have creators creating creators forever. And that's actually not possible. And the reason it's not possible, just to tell you briefly why it's not possible, and I'll give you an example, I'll give you an analogy. If I said to someone, oh, can you help me lift up this podium? I can't do it by myself. And you say, sure, I will help you lift up the podium, but I need someone else to help me. And that person says, well, I'll help you only if you help me. And so if everyone makes the condition that I will only help if someone ever helps, will this podium ever be lifted? Huh? will never be lifted, right? So if you have creators creating, creators creating, creators ad infinitum, you never get anything created, right? Okay. So it makes sense that the creator is infinite, eternal, without beginning, without end. That the creator is self-sufficient. We, we summarize all of this by saying, transcendent that the creator is not like anything in this universe and that how could you have more than one transcendent being and even again common sense tells us that the precision the precision that we find and the unity that we find in the creational process makes us understand there could only be one mastermind behind this. If there were different creators, in fact, what we would find would be chaos and disunity, not this type of consistent precision throughout our universe. And this is why, really, it makes so much sense to believe. It's common sense to believe that there is one God, that there is one wise, powerful, intelligent creator that is unique who has brought this universe into existence. This is common sense. This is reason. This is why human beings, as I said, everywhere, historically, you will find in every culture, there is this belief in the transcendent creator. You see, the Quran says that in fact, the real problem with the human beings is not that they don't believe in God. Most human beings believe in God and they believe that there is one God, meaning they believe that there is one creator. But what they do is they actually give to the created things some of the powers or the knowledge that in fact only rightly belongs to God. So they attribute to the creation. They imagine that some things in the creation have powers that only God has. Or sometimes they also attribute to God some of the deficiencies and the shortcomings in the creation. And the reason they do this is because they speak about God without knowledge. They invent things because actually the truth is that what we can know about God through reason and common sense is in fact severely limited. Now some people 
when they are faced with that limitation, they've come up with different ideas. If you look at the philosophical tradition and the Western philosophical tradition, okay, you have a group of people who lived and they were very uh, influential in the last, last 200 years. They were called deists. Deists believed that there was a creator. They believed that it was extremely logical to believe that this universe had a creator. But they did not believe in a personal God. In other words, they didn't believe that God actually really cared about human beings. So is this God created the universe, but about us, and, and the idea that we could have some sort of contact and relationship with this God, they considered that to be, you know, they didn't believe that. Okay? They dismissed this. But philosophically, they understood the power of this belief in this idea that there was this supreme being. Other, many other people came to this same type of conclusion. But what they believed is that, no, we could communicate with God, but not directly. God is so different from us that, you know, you can't have any direct communication with God. And then what they obviously did is they began to imagine, and this is where they begin, to start thinking that God has some of the deficiencies of the creation. And they start to imagine that God is like a created thing, which actually contradicts their original premise. They end up contradicting themselves. But, for example, idol worshippers. Most intelligent idol worshippers don't actually claim that the idol itself that they are worshipping actually has any power. They believe that somehow these idols represent spirits or powers or beings that can be intermediaries or intercessors between them and God. And they give an example. They say, for example, look, if you want to go and see Tony Blair, yeah, I'm not saying this is exactly the example they give, but, you know, if you want to go and see Tony Blair, you don't just go up and say, hey, Tony, you know, can I have a chat with you? So, oh, my God, it's one of those Muslims. <laughs> Run. Okay. No, I mean, you know, they will say, no, you have to go through Tony's cronies. Yeah? You have to go through the cronies of Tony, right? If you want to get to him. So you have to go to those people who he knows. Or even you have to go through the cronies of the cronies. Or the cronies of the cronies of the cronies. Depending. Yeah? You know, if you're really like just a nobody. But of course, if you're rich and middle class, you know, you could probably get to see him straight away. If you have enough money, he might even come to visit you. Yeah? But for you ordinary people, Muslims, yeah, especially those veiled women, you could take your veil off, then maybe we'll talk to you. <laughs> yeah? Okay? No, no, no. You know, you have to go through special channels. And they say, well, it's like that with God, you see? You can't just talk straight to God. You have to go through those people who are close to God. You have to go to the priest who will then talk to, you know, this super sort of semi-god who will pass on the message bit by bit you have to go through so the imagined god is like a king or a prime minister or something you know surrounded by all these cronies and these sort of demigods and these things you have that's how you have to get to god that's how they portray it okay of course the problem with this is that immediately these people have pursued presumed that God suffers from the limitations and the deficiencies of the human beings. Right? Because why does Tony need cronies? Can anyone tell me? Why does Tony need cronies? Because he's a human being. He's afraid of being assassinated. He's afraid of terrorists. He's also afraid. He's not also not afraid. He just simply doesn't have enough time to deal with the complaint of every single individual person, right? He has to eat his dinner. He has to spend time with Cherry and his family, right? He has to go on holiday, usually at the expense of some rich friend of his, you know? Nothing wrong with that, actually. I don't think there's anything wrong. Personally, I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. 
And I, how could I? My parents were always, you know, helping me go on holiday and visit them and stuff like that. But anyway, you know, that aside. Um, you know, so he has to have people. See, is this really worth me dealing with? If every single person wanted to personally complain to the prime minister about every single little problem that they had, would he be able to deal with that? Of course he wouldn't, because he's human. He has 24 hours in a day. He's limited. You see, but God is not limited like that. Allah, God, the creator who has created this whole universe, can hear the complaint of every single human being. And not only that, an incredible thing. If every single human being complained to God, all at the same time, God could hear every voice of every human being and God could give every one of them what they wanted and that would be easy for God. Right? Now, how about the human beings? If you all start talking to me at the same time, could I understand what you're going on about? Could I? Could I? No, I can't. And the reason I can't is because I'm human. Let's think about what that means in respect to those people who pray to saints and prophets. There are even some Muslims who do this. And now we can see how people start to make others equal with Allah. So now let's say that I am praying to Saint Anthony or some Muslim is praying to Abdul Qadir Al Jalani or Prophet Muhammad or Prophet Jesus Okay, or whatever, right? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi salam. Are you telling me that, not just me by the way, oh, let's just say that one million Muslims all at the same time are asking and calling upon the Prophet Muhammad. Or one million Catholics all at the same time are calling upon Saint Anthony. Are you telling me? that Saint Anthony can hear one million voices all at the same time? If you're telling me that he can, then actually you are not describing a human being anymore. You are saying that he has powers that are actually divine powers. You are now beginning to make that person equal with Allah, with God. Whether it's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Prophet Isa, or Saint Anthony, or Abdul Qadir al-Jalani. If you first of all put aside the argument of whether the dead can even hear the living. Okay, let's put that aside. Although I believe that the dead cannot hear the living. That's why it's called barzak. Calling upon a dead person is like calling upon a brick. But let's put that aside. Let's say they can hear. Are you saying they can hear these multiple voices all at the same time? You're not really saying they're human anymore. And they could deal with all these prayers and all of these supplications? Hmm. That's a divine attribute. And this is how people either, they imagine that God, Allah, is limited. See, they've They've given to Allah limitations and they've given to human beings exaggerations. This is how people start to make and worship things and they put... And listen, if I pray to St. Anthony, don't I hope that he's going to hear me? Don't I trust that he's going to answer my prayers? Don't I, don't I put then faith and hope and trust and I believe that he's going to give me what I want and what I need? Or if I pray to Prophet Muhammad or Jesus or whoever it may be, isn't that therefore, doesn't it therefore become a God, an object of worship? It does. Of course it does. And the Quran deals with this. Actually, there is something more foolish about idolatry. And the basic reason why it's foolish is because of simple common sense. Any human being who spends some time thinking about it would realize this is foolishness. And again, the Quran appeals to common sense. A beautiful story is the story of Abraham. See, Prophet Abraham, he is well known for smashing idols. Bit of a radical. 
Uh, can you imagine that these days? Prophet Abraham tried so hard to convince his people. You see, from a young age, he was brought up his father's house. He was watching his father used to make idols. So he used to see his dad get a piece of wood, chop up the piece of wood and make an idol, use the, you know, the chippings to heat the fire to cook their food. Yeah, And then this idol which he made, he would see his dad give it to the people and the people would pray to it. And he realized this is the same thing we were cooking our dinner with. Right? And now the people are worshipping it. He's brought up realizing that what is this? And then he noticed the people, they're worshipping the sun, the moon and the stars. But he's looking. He's seeing, well the stars are there and then the moon comes out and outshines the stars. And then the sun comes and that outshines everything. And then the sun sets. And why are we worshipping things that obviously are controlled by something else? It doesn't make any sense to worship them. They don't have the power. They're under the power of something else. And he realizes that these things are not true gods. They shouldn't be worshipped. Why should we worship these things that come and go and temporary? Because if they can go, that means they can let us down. The time we really need them is when they're not there. So why should I worship that? Why should I put my faith in that? Why should I put my trust in that? So one day he's determined. He says to his people, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove to you that your worship of the idols is false. So when his people have gone, you know, it's their festivity and it's their religious festival, he doesn't want to participate in it because he doesn't want to be involved in their idol worship at all. So he says to them, I'm sick. He says, I'm sick. Meaning, actually, he was sick of what they're doing. So when they were doing this, he went into the temple and he smashed all the idols except the chief idol. And he took his axe and he hung it around the neck of the chief idol. Now when the people came back, they were outraged. Who has committed this blasphemy? Who has done this to our gods? And they, some people said, well, you remember that young man, Abraham? He was saying that he was going to prove our idols are false. So the king, he brings Abraham in front of the people. He says, Abraham, did you do this to our gods? So Abraham says, ask the big one. A ask him. So... Then they look at each other and, and they say to Abraham, you know, Abraham, you know that our gods can't talk to us. He says, why do you worship something that can bring you no benefit and no harm? And this, this idol can't even protect itself. How is it going to protect you? Isn't that common sense? Isn't that just common sense? Isn't it our common everyday experience? You who are students here in Buckinghamshire and Chiltern University, yeah? When, when you want to study in a university, now these days you need loans, right? You need money because you have to pay for some of it, right? Okay? Where did you go to get the money? Did you go to the guy begging on the street sitting outside the railway station? Excuse me, mate, you know, I need to go to university. Could I borrow a couple of thousand quid? Did you do that? Did anyone do that? I don't think so. Because if this guy can't help himself, how is he going to help you? When Kuwait was invaded by Iraq, who did they appeal to for help? Bangladesh? Bangladesh with one helicopter? Uh, nothing against Bangladesh, but you know, if you want military aid, Bangladesh had one at the time, I remember reading, they had one helicopter, right? They couldn't cope with the floods in their own country. How would they possibly be able to supply military aid to Kuwait? And nothing against Bangladesh, nothing against the guy begging in the street. It's just common sense. You don't ask someone who can't help themselves, right? Common sense. That's all it is. Common sense. So if the idol cannot do anything for itself, how is it going to be able to do something for you? I mean, isn't it extraordinary? You go to the shop. Excuse me, I'd like that idol over there. Okay, he brings the idol down. And this idol can't, you might think it might fly down itself, right? No, he, he brings it down. And he pays money for the idol. He actually pays money to get the idol. 
And then he carries it home. Not the, the idol doesn't carry him. So that's it. Now I'm your God. I'll carry you home. No. He carries the idol home and he puts it up on the shelf. You know. And if it fell down again, he'd have to put it up again. Right? And then he says, oh, such and such. Help me. Give me this. Give me that. Does that make any sense? Same thing. Muslims do it. A person dies. They wash him. He can't wash himself. They shroud him. He can't shroud himself. They carry him to the grave and they bury him in the grave. And they say, oh, such and such. Do this and that for us. Extraordinary. Does this make any sense? And Allah is just appealing to common sense. So this is one broad category. These are false gods. These are things that we should not worship. They cannot give you what you need and what you want. They can't even help themselves. Here is the argument. Whatever things you could say, oh, sometimes my prayers were answered. It's just coincidence. And there are many reasons to explain, okay, why they, amazing things could happen to these idols. But nothing could go against this common sense. Okay, let's look at another category. The other category is the category of the man-god. There are many religions throughout history who have believed that some human being is actually God. Now, the example the Quran uses is the example of Christianity. There are Christians who claim that Jesus is Allah. That he is not just the son of Allah, but he is Allah. He is one and part and the same as God. And the Quran appeals to such beautiful, commonsensical things. The Quran says, didn't Jesus and his mother, because some people also worship Mary, and there were some Christians who used to believe also Mary was God. Even Catholics say that Mary is the mother of God. The mother of God? God had a mummy. So God, mama, mama. Right? Changing God's nappy. Yeah? Cleaning God's bum when he's done a poo. This is, what, what, what's that? Mother of God. Huh? Feeding God. What is this? To say that some human being is equal with God. Didn't he walk on the earth and breathe air and eat food and they went to the marketplace? You know, they needed to buy things. They went to the marketplace. See how Allah makes things clear. See how people are deluded away from the truth. What is this? Allah asks us in the Quran. If God wanted to destroy Jesus and Mary and everything in the whole earth, who could stop him? Of course, no one. That means that Allah has power over Jesus and Mary. If God has power over them and they are under the authority of God, they can't be the same as God. They can't be. And what does that mean anyway? To say that something is man and God at the same time. It's an impossibility to say that something, by definition, God is infinite, self-sufficient, and eternal. Human beings, by definition, are temporary, mortal, and needy. How can something be eternal and temporary both at the same time? How can something be self-sufficient and needy both at the same time? How can something be eternal and finite both at the same time? It's, an, it's not a paradox. A paradox means something that seems impossible, but it's not. No, it is an impossibility by definition. Now, there are things that Christians say, God can do anything. Well, I mean, this raises a whole load of questions. God can do anything. I always say, well, do you believe God can do something evil? Now, either they will say, no, God can't do something evil. Or they'll say, well, he can if he wanted to, but he would never do something evil. I say, why not? They say, because God is good. God only does good things. I say, exactly. It is the nature of God. The nature of God is that God is good. 
And a good God does not do evil things. It is also the nature of God that God is eternal. So an eternal God doesn't become temporary. It's the nature of God that he is self-sufficient, free of any wants and needs. So God does not become needy. Because that contradicts the nature of God. It's that simple. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that just common sense? Now, you know, the whole idea that God becomes a man. Okay. You see, the problem is this. If you have a piece of string, yeah? And the piece of string is in the shape of a square. Yeah? Let's say the square represents the, the, the attributes of God. All right? I'm not saying that God is like a square. I'm just saying it represents. So the square, we replace infinite, eternal, self-sufficient. And we just, instead of all of those words, we just have a square. Yeah? And the circle represents the qualities of a human being. Needy, temporary, finite, mortal. You know, we're born, we die, we forget. We need to eat, we need to breathe. So these are our, and let's say all of these, we forget those words and we just use it as a circle. Now just theoretically, what we could do perhaps is we could get the piece of string and change the shape of the piece of string from a square to a circle. So perhaps you could make the square into a circle and you could make the circle into a square. But what you can't do is make the square into a circle and it's still a square at the same time. Right? Something can't be blue and red and still be blue. It can't, you can't make blue red and it's still blue. The circle can't be made a square and still be a circle. But that's what they're trying to say. God became a man but was still God. Doesn't make any sense. It's an impossibility. And wait a minute. These Christians are telling everybody in the world that you're going to go to hell forever. If you don't believe something impossible... If you, God is telling us, according to their religion, if we don't believe something absolutely impossible, you'll go to hell forever. So I have to believe something impossible without any proof. Because by definition, you can never prove an impossibility. How can you prove something impossible? You can't. So I have to believe something impossible without proof. It's simple. I'll tell you something. And this is what I always say to every Christian. I say, you're telling me that on the day of judgment, I stand in front of God. And God says to me, why didn't you believe that I became a man? I will say, how could I believe that you, Allah, the eternal self-sufficient creator of the heavens and the earth, was a temporary mortal needy man? How could I believe such a thing? You are far above that. If God then puts me in hell forever... I will never feel for one moment of eternity that God has treated me fairly or justly. But if a Christian is asked by God, how did you, could you say that I was equal, that this human being was me? This human being that ate my food. This human being that breathed my air. This human that depended upon me for, my entire, for his entire existence. You're saying that this human being was equal to me? If that person goes to hell forever, they will know that they deserve to be there. They all know it. That's justice. That is justice. There's one other thing I want us to think about. And I like to give this as an example. Right? Modern science has made us appreciate something really remarkable. And that remarkable thing is exactly how minute we are. Actually, 1,400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad okay, was also, in reflection of the words of the Qur'an, reminding us of our humble origins. The Qur'an reminds us that you came from a sperm drop, a despised fluid. The Qur'an reminds us of our base origins. The Prophet Muhammad even mentioned that the universe compared to the kursi, wasiya kursi samawati wal ard, and Allah's kursi, his pedestal, extends over the heavens and the earth. How? The Prophet Muhammad said, 
The universe is like a ring in the desert compared to the kursi. A ring in the desert. Think about that. Think about a ring in the desert. How big is the desert and how small is the ring? And the kursi compared to the arsh, and the arsh means the throne of God, is also like a ring in the desert. Our universe is like a speck. Like a speck. Now, we are on an earth which is a speck in a ga solar system which is a speck on the outer spiral of our galaxy which itself is a speck in the universe which is a speck before the kursi which is a speck before the arsh. Now if I said to anyone, oi speck, even if I said it nicely, oh beloved speck, <laughs> oh noble speck, oh good speck, but if I call you a speck, it doesn't matter how many nice things I put with it, calling per a person a speck is not a nice thing. But you know what? We are specks. I wouldn't be lying if I called you a speck, and you wouldn't be lying if you called me a speck. But still, we don't like it. How about then if we said that God is like a speck, whose kursi extends over the heavens and the earth, which is like a ring before his throne. So how about God? You say that God is like a speck? In fact, you said God became a speck on a speck in a speck in a speck. That's equal with God. That is insulting God. Common sense. That is common sense. Now some people say, no, we don't believe that Jesus is God. We believe he's the son of God. But that's not any better. That's not any better. Saying that God has a son is not much better. That's still insulting God. That's still saying that the child of God, the son of God, is what? Some insignificant creature? Some speck on the earth? And I don't mean here to belittle Jesus, alayhi salam. Okay? Of course. With Allah, he is an honored slave. But that's what we are. We are creatures of God. We are the creation of God. We are, are the slaves of God. The only difference is, what sort of person are you? Do you believe in God? Do you insult God? Or do you honor God? Do you obey God? Or do you disobey God? That is the only difference between the human beings. Not your caste. Not your color. Not whether you're middle class, upper class, lower class. Okay? None of those things matter to Allah at all. What matters is, are you faithful? Do you honor God? Do you praise God? Do you obey God? That's it. If you do that, God loves you. If you don't, He doesn't. It's that simple. It's that simple. So you're either one or the other. All the other things are artificial and of no concern to God. So this is what is important. So we are all creatures of God. But what does it mean, son of God? Think about that. I mean, I remember there was an Anglican priest who came to the same conclusion. He was saying, what on earth is this supposed to mean, son of God? He, he thought about it himself, and he realized that, what is that supposed to mean? You see, when we use the term son, what do we mean by that? My son, right? So first meaning is the literal meaning, begotten son. The word begotten means born of the act of sexual intercourse. Are we saying that God had sex with a woman and had sons? Allah does not, God does not have sons and daughters. God does not have intimate relations with, and, and this is why the Quran asks, if God had a son who is God's wife, because presumably God would not make fornication and adultery illegal for us and then practice it himself. Does God, but of course the, even the concept of God having intercourse is absurd. So obviously God did not have a literal son. God did not have beget a son. 
all right? Because my son is human like me. By the way, if you have any doubts, you can study early Christian theology. Some early Christians, one of the evidences they actually bought to claim that Jesus was God is exactly this argument. They said, my son is human like me, therefore God's son must be divine like God. That's exactly the argument they bought. Meaning they actually had this idea that God must have literally begotten, literally begotten a son. Which is ascribing a calamity. Allah refutes this time and time and time. In fact, one of the reasons that the Quran has been revealed is to refute those people who say that Allah has a son. This is actually mentioned. Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Kahf. One of the reasons why Allah has revealed the Quran is to refute those people. And by the way, this is something that many pagans had this idea. Many pagans had this idea. Zeus, for example. Zeus had mistresses and wives and sun gods and, you know. So, for example, Hercules was the son of Zeus. So they had this idea that their sons would marry and, you know, have mistresses from amongst women of the earth and these half-gods would be born and so on and so forth. This was their idea. It's a pagan idea. It's not a monotheistic idea. Which, by the way, indicates that really Christianity is so much of it taken from paganism. Anyway, I don't want to get, because I, get, I could go quite far into talking about that. But it's another topic. So the Son of God. Okay, so we say, most Christians, you actually say, no, 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 we don't believe that God. Of course we don't believe God is, you know, that Jesus literally is the actual, but you know, literally begotten Son of God. So we say, well, what do you mean? Do you mean God adopted Jesus as a son? Again, it doesn't make any sense. Let me give you an example, right? If I bought with me today a goldfish, yeah? I have a little thing, and I bring with me a goldfish, and I say, everybody, um, this is Jonah, my son. So it's a goldfish. Well, it's, it's my son. He eats with me at the table. The, uh, the, he has a bedroom in the house. And according to the new adoption laws that they've just passed in England, very liberal, he, he, the, the papers are coming through next week. He's my son. Now, you, you would say, look, that's a fish. You're a human being. You can't have a fish as your son. Because the fish is not like you. But let me ask another question then. How is a human being like God? The human beings who are specks on an earth that is a speck. In fact, isn't it true that I am actually more like a fish than I'm like God? Isn't it true that any human being has more similarity to a fish than they have to God? You see, the fish is born and the fish dies. Human beings are born and human beings die. The fish need to eat and they need to get rid of what they eat. Human beings need to eat and they get rid of what they eat. Right? The limit, the vision of the fish is limited. My vision is limited. The fish can only remember so much. I can only remember so much. My knowledge is limited. My powers are limited. My ability is limited. This is what I share in common with the fish. Whereas God, His seeing is without limit. His knowledge is perfect. God is never born and God never ties. God is eternal. How am I like God? In what way am I like God? Even a fish, maybe not a fish, but certainly an animal can even show compassion to its child. I don't know, I saw the most remarkable program, nature program. I can't even remember where I saw it. And I was absolutely transfixed. It was about the, the crossing in the Serengetis. You have two parts. You have Masai Mara, and you have it's the plains where all the animals are in Kenya and Tanzania. And there's this famous place where the wildebeest, and all, in fact, not just the wildebeest, all the animals, the zebras, the wildebeest, they cross the river and the crocodiles get them. You must have seen that. Amazing thing. There was one, and they were following this one baby wildebeest. It was crossing with its mother. And we know how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that, you know, that Allah has divided His mercy into 100 parts. 
One part he put on this earth. Now the one part of Allah's mercy is even so the, the love that the, the mother has for the child. Right? And, and I saw in this thing how this baby wildebeest couldn't climb up to the other side. He couldn't, this baby wildebeest could not reach to the other side of the river. And in fact, climbing, it fell down and it ended up being washed down the street. Somehow the crocodile didn't eat it. And it ended up going right back to the other side. The mother had made it. Do you know what this mother did? You know what the mother wildebeest did? She went back across the river. She went back across the river, facing the hippopotamuses, right, which were attacking them, the crocodiles which were eating them. Did she care? No. She went right back across to go after her little baby. That is the compassion in an animal, in a creature. So even animals can have compassion. Doesn't make them divine. So what do we mean, son of God? What does this mean? Again, no, we are creatures of God. We are the creatures of God. We are the servants of God. These, all of this is to show us, look at the things that people worship. Look at the things they put their faith and their trust. These are the false gods. None of these things are truly worthy of us worshiping them. Now, I've got two more things that I want to mention. Only two more things and I won't dwell on them for long but two more categories the next category I want to deal with is race tribalism this is a false god as well and the people that are used in the Quran as an example they're not the only people who have this quality but the ones that who are used in as example for this are the Jews because amongst them are many who think that they are better purely because of being a Jew. It's racism. They think they are God's chosen, favored people purely by virtue of their ancestry. And God refused this utterly and completely in the Quran. And it has been completely and utterly refuted by the Prophet Muhammad. No human being is better than another human being based upon who they are descended from. And of course the Jews are not the only people who suffer this delusion. And of course I mean to say by the way not all the Jews because a true pious Jew would never believe such a thing. But in fact the Prophet Muhammad said that you Muslims, the ones that you Muslims you resemble mostly you have the closest resemblance to are the children of Israel you are most like them and you find unfortunately many Muslims have the same idea I am better because my ancestors were Muslim not because of me and what sort of Muslim I am and how I follow my religion no my descent. what do you know you're a new Muslim I mean this is what I've seen it myself firsthand 20 years I've been a Muslim and I experienced a lot of it from the Muslim community. What do you know? You're a new Muslim. My ancestors were Muslims. My great, 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 whatever. As if, so what? What's that got to do with anything? SubhanAllah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the first time he publicly called people to Islam, he called the different tribes, these tribes who he was related to, he called his own tribe, even his own tribe daughter his own daughter Fatima he said I cannot help you at all against Allah meaning you being my daughter will not help you one single little bit against Allah when you meet Allah the fact that you're my daughter is not going to help you if that's Fatima the daughter of Prophet Muhammad how about everybody else sallallahu alayhi wasallam but this is a delusion. Many people suffer this delusion. Racism. We're better because we're British. Get rid of the Pakis. Get rid of the niggers. Get them out. Yeah, Britain will be great again. Yeah, you've heard all of that, haven't you? I, I can just imagine them cutting and, cutting and pasting that one. Yeah? <laughs> Racist Muslim. BMP Muslim, you know? 
Oh, you, you, you heard that. As if what? Being white makes you better? Why? What is better about being white? Or being brown or being anything? Why would a color of your skin have anything to do with making you a better person? But there are many people who suffer this delusion. And it is a type of idolatry. It's a type of shirk. It's a type of false god. Because that's what they think. You see, these BMP Nazi people imagine, right, that when we get rid of such and such undesirable people, everyone who's not white, who's not British, when we get rid of them, we will be great and we will be successful. So they imagine that being British is the way that you get what you want and get what you need. It's a god. It becomes a religion. Think about that when they call us to Britishness. And most of what they say is perfectly acceptable, alhamdulillah. You know, tolerance and, you know, and decency and, you know, fair play. And those are the things that, you know, the good qualities we think and queuing, you know, being polite. Oh, seriously, those are good qualities. You know, there's a few other qualities, though, however, we could say are not such good qualities. And those are the ones that Muslims tend to have problems with. You know, emerging at 2 o'clock in the morning from pubs and nightclubs and puking up and fighting and, uh, you know, and a whole bunch of other things that really are not really desirable, even from the point of view of being a policeman. Those things are not very desirable. And that's quite widespread, unfortunately. Even in Europe, British people have got the reputation of being yobs. And it's not me. It's not what I said. It's what the, they said in the British newspapers even. So the point being that your race has got nothing to do with it. Okay, it's not only, of course, the Bani Israel or the Jews who have that attitude. Lots of people have it. Okay, and it's a false god. Now the final thing is the biggest false god of all. The longest running, the biggest one, the most worshipped one, and that is the god of materialism. The idea that science... Power, wealth, technology, these are the things that are going to make you successful in life. I wonder, did I, I didn't bring it with me. Did anyone see um, the newspaper today? Uh, the, the London paper or whatever it is? Or, you know, it's High Wycombe, of course, but right, the, you'll read about it tomorrow, I'm sure. Um, Robbie Williams. Yeah? How much is that money does that guy earn? 30 million a year or a day, <laughs> and he is on antidepressants. He's just gone into a clinic, and we are being told every day, we need to be wealthier as this country. We need to be richer. Money, money, money. Work harder. Make more money. What did it do for him, his 30 million a year? Does wealth equal happiness? Put that on a broad scale, because we are being told you know, we can all live the American dream. No, we can't. If every human being on this planet lived the way an American, the average American, the average American, if every human being lived the way an average American lived, we would need something like three and a half planets in order to be able to provide all the resources for that. That's the footprint of your average American. They say you, he is consuming that you would need three and a half planets. For every human being to live the way you live, you'd need three and a half planets. You can't all live the American dream. To claim that we can all enjoy our lives materialistically is a lie. And the, and the claim that it is the way to success is a falsehood. The idea that science will produce the solutions. Tony Blair, right? Here we're confronted with global warming, the biggest catastrophe. The chief scientist in this country said, forget terrorism. The worst disaster that is going to hit the world is global warming. It's going to make terrorism look like nothing. I don't notice any war on global warming. A few little cries here, oh, we need to reduce a few carbon emissions, but not on my holiday. <laughs> yeah? Right? Yes? But we're ready to send soldiers to die in Iraq to fight terrorism, which isn't even there anyway in the first place. You know, doesn't that make you think just a little bit? 
the really dangerous things in the world, okay, global warming, chief scientist, that's what he's saying, but how much effort are we ready to expend upon that? We're ready to spend a lot of effort fighting a few, let's be honest, a few crazed individuals. Because that's really what they are. I'm not saying they haven't got reasons to be mad, but they're not good enough reasons to go around blowing up women and children. So they are crazed. Sorry. But that's the fact. Yet all of this effort, all of these laws being passed, so many laws restricting our freedoms, indefinite detention, because you might be suspected somehow of encouraging somebody in some particular way of, you know, and so on and so forth. Stripping away our freedoms in the name of protecting our freedoms. Okay? You know, we should think about this. What's it all really about? But you know what the truth is? Science is not going to find the answer. And if you think we're the first people who thought that, we're not. Believe me, every civilization, you can look, the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Byzantines, the Chaldeans. Have you ever heard of the Chaldeans, by the way? Ever, anyone heard of Ur? Does anyone speak Chaldean today? Do you know Chaldean used to be spoken virtually across the world? Did you know that rather like English is today? They used to have schools across the world to, 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 so people could learn Chaldean. This was in ancient times. This is how influential the Chaldeans were. And now you haven't even heard of them. You haven't even heard of them. You know, one day, you know what I suggest? You don't have to go far. Go up, drive up to the north of England and go and stand on Hadrian's Wall. It's still there, little bits of it. Hadrian's Wall, I used to do that quite often. And then I would stand on Hadrian's Wall. I wouldn't look north up to Scotland. I'd look south. And I'd think, you know what? Once upon a time, a Roman legionnaire stood right here. And he probably thought to himself, as far as I can travel and as far as I can go is Rome. The empire of Rome. What's left? of the empire of Rome. What's left of Greece, of Babylon, of ancient Egypt? Allah says in the Quran, travel the earth and see what happened to those people, see what happened to those civilizations. And believe me, you study, they thought they had all the answers. They thought their technology, their science, their industry, they thought that they were masters of everything. But what is left? That is the pipe dream of materialism. It is the pipe dream, the false god, the biggest false god of all. The idea that in money and wealth and science and technology is the true answer to all of our problems. In it we put our faith and our trust. See on the dollar bill, in God we trust. Should be in this dollar bill we trust. This is the God. Woe be, the Prophet said, to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. Because you can worship money. Just like anything else. That's really the end of my talk. Except for one final and very important thing that I want you to think about. And this, I hope, is the conclusion. Okay? The final thing is when we talk about knowledge, when we talk about knowing something, okay, most of us think and imagine it means the thinking process. But let me give you an example. Imagine this is very hot, red hot, yeah? If I pick it, what do I do? Do, do I have to think about dropping that thing? Do I think about it? Or do I just... What is it called when I just go like that? What do we call it? It's a instinct. It's an instinct. An instinctive reaction. But isn't that a type of knowledge also? Imagine if we didn't have those instinctive reactions. Imagine if we have to actually think, wait a minute, this is hot. Oh, you know, the, by the time we'd actually thought about it, there's a reason why it happens instinctively. And it's a type of knowledge. 
an essential type of knowledge for our survival. Scientists would say we have evolved it. But you know, there's another very interesting type of instinctive knowledge. And you only find the people who really talk about it are Muslims. It's the same like when you pick up something very hot. When human beings are in a condition of extreme distress, I don't mean like a little bit warm, but extreme distress. And the Quran gives the example of a boat that is on the sea. And imagine the waves are crashing over this boat like the roof of a tent. This is how the waves are. This storm. And the people know that they are about to be doomed. So now, what, you know, the captain is not going to save them. The captain's been washed overboard. The technology is not going to save them. The boat itself is breaking up. Do people think their money is going to help them now? Their British passport, is that going to help them? Their caste, the color of their skin, the tribe they're from? All those gods, all those things that they put their faith and they put their hope and they put their trust in, they forget them. And what do they do? They start calling upon that one being that they know instinctively, they know it is knowledge from inside themselves that there is one being. This being is not anything in this universe. No, this being has power over everything in the universe. It's not the name here that is important, but the one they are calling to is truly Allah, is truly the Creator, the one who has power over all things. And then Allah asks them, and you know that that's true. Every human being, they know in their heart that that is true. Then why? In that moment when you have complete faith in Allah, why then do you put your faith and your trust and your hope in other than Allah? Why do you worship other than your Lord? Because ultimately, all those things, they are false. Because at that moment, the one that you rely upon and hope in completely and utterly is Allah, the Creator, alone. This is the beautiful, simple message of Islam. This is the beautiful, simple message of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of Jesus, the true message of Jesus, alayhi salam, of Musa, the true message of Moses, alayhi salam, of Abraham alayhi salam. This is the true message of all the prophets that we should abandon the worship, the false gods. And in fact, we should worship the one true God, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, Jazakallah khair. The talk went on really quite long. Uh, Insha'Allah. Jazakallah khair for listening. I hope we all benefited from it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May God's peace and blessings be upon you all and may Allah guide all of us uh, closer to the truth. Jazakallah.